Hi there. My name's Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In my opinion, Ben Jordan is making the most interesting content on YouTube today. You may know Ben from his music, which he produces under the name The Flashbulb, and he makes some fascinating videos about music production. But there are two things that set Ben apart. One is his scientific content. Not only does he explain things in a clear and entertaining way, but he conducts real experiments and performs demos that are on par with anything you would find from much bigger channels like Veritasium. The other thing that sets Ben apart are his deep dives into the modern economic factors affecting the music industry and society in general. And it was with great interest that I watched Ben's latest video in this series called Why Mo Died As We Know It. And I agree with most of what Ben says in this video. But when he was discussing Behringer's clone of the Mini Moog Model D, I popped a metaphorical blood vessel in my brain when he said this. The only thing that's being cloned are the front panels. The insides could not be more different. Ben, we've been through this already. I already made a video about this responding to another video you made about Behringer when you were talking about clone circuits. I haven't gone over the Model D PCB in detail. I haven't traced it out and compared it to an original Mini Moog schematic. But knowing what I know about the Mini Moog circuit, just looking it over, it looks like all the parts are there. They're surface mount and they're not through hole, but that doesn't matter. And yes, there's a different layout. And yes, these things will lead to different parasitic capacitances, but those differences are going to be less than the various differences you'll get in inherent part tolerances anyway. And it's not like this is a 10 gigahertz scope where those subtle differences in PCB layout and through hole versus surface mount might matter. And the Behringer unit has some additional doodads like various ins and outs and MIDI. But the part of the circuit that really matters, the part that makes the sound, is probably pretty close to the original Mini Moog circuit, because there's really no reason that Behringer couldn't make it close. There's no magic here. It's just resistors, capacitors, and transistors. There's no unobtainium. To be clear, I'm just talking about the science of the circuit. I'm not talking about whether what Behringer is doing with these clones is ethical one way or another. That's a separate discussion. And Behringer is a problematic company for myriad reasons that have nothing to do with cloning circuits. And although I wouldn't say that my PP was hurt, I do take some issue with Ben using the term counterfeit to refer to the Behringer clones and things like it. Counterfeit kind of implies you're making a product where you're trying to fool someone into thinking it's a product by a different company. Nobody's going to look at the Centavo by Warm Audio and think that it's an original clone built by Bill Finnegan. Now, with the caveat that I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering and not a professor of law, I suppose one could argue that the Centavo violates Bill Finnegan's trade dress on the clone, whereas the Tumnus by Brian Wampler is a take on the clone that doesn't violate that trade dress in the same way. And there are some unscrupulous people who are flat out counterfeiting the clone, trying to make it look like an original clone. I don't think anyone's currently making anything that anyone would mistake for a mini Moog Model D reissue by Moog Music. But there is this trade dress issue, and Behringer has been sued over that before. If you would like some more food for thought on these issues, I highly recommend this video by Josh Scott of JHS Pedals titled, What You Need to Know About Pedal Clones.